I know I should just let it pass, but I can't. The hymn that we just sang are ancient words, words that are with us for a long time, but the tune is dedicated to Denny Bernard. So we celebrate you, Denny, for this, and it's written by John Carter in your honor. So we celebrate John as well. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Every single one of us dreams of home. We dream of home as a place which has a certain spirit of love and tranquility. We dream of home with certain people we wish to be close to, located in a place which brings us peace. At some level in our hearts and minds, all of us dream of making home, finding home, and eventually going home. Finding home is a theme in our passages today. In 1 Peter, in Acts, and in John, we encounter three passages of Scripture about the authenticity of finding our home in Christ. 1 Peter 2, 2 through 10, we find safe haven, like little babies. The spiritual milk we need to grow in our faith is there in Christ. We ourselves become part of the very structure of the home, the spiritual house that 1 Peter speaks of. If we remember that his audience was a group of dispossessed people, if you will, homeless people, people who had no unifying dignity and identity apart from being the church. The power of these words expands in our hearing because of that. What a transformation to be no people and then to become God's people. That's what this passage is talking about. If you have ever felt like nobody and then somebody, then you can really identify with Peter's words. Have you ever felt outside? Have you ever felt alone, not a part of something greater than yourself? If you have, then you can step into Peter's understanding and we can perceive un and understand how this would be to the hearers of these words, those dispossessed people. If they knew that they were nobody in the eyes and the mind of the world, but then become part of somebody, the chosen people, the holy race, the royal priesthood, then all of a sudden things change. What would it feel like to come out of darkness into the marvelous light of God? That's what Peter's talking about here, coming home to Christ. The stoning death of Stephen in Acts takes us to another realm of peace in Christ, Stephen is so wrapped up in living, God, living God's way that he forgets to protect himself. Stephen is like many others, an ordinary Christian, if you will, but he gets so caught up in Christ that he gives himself fully to God. Like Stephen, those who we call martyrs have this quality. Rather than being somebody who doesn't really care much or do much, in any regard with anyone. They live fully into the call to serve Christ, they l to love and be witnesses of the faith. They're living stones, we understand, in the household of our faith. As martyrs of our faith, Stephen and others through the ages find eternal home in Christ, and that is the home they're seeking. How did Stephen arrive in his heavenly home? Well, we know some things about Stephen. Stephen was the first martyr of our faith. He was one of the first seven deacons of the first congregational church in Jerusalem. I don't think they actually called themselves first congregational, but they were the first church in Jerusalem around 33 AD, right? And as I said earlier this morning, I said to Martha at the first service, I said, they only needed seven deacons and look what they did. I said, I'm not suggesting we take away eight. <laughs> so, but li listen to what he did as one of the seven. His job was to serve tables, to help around the church as whatever need presented itself in the church, and then, when that was finished, to go to the streets 
and care for the poor of Jerusalem. But like our deacons, Stephen didn't just accept what was written down in the job description to do his work. He went off the page beyond the job description, which is a quality of our deacons as well. Once the apostles' hands had been laid upon his head, all the grace and power of baptism in Jesus' name flowed into him, and he was fired up and ready to go. Now this deacon gets it into his heart, mind, and spirit that he needs to climb into the pulpit and preach, and that's exactly what he does. And when Stephen preaches with power, he gets into trouble for telling the truth. That happens to preachers. His accusers say he is slandering Moses and God, but he points out that everything he says was first said by Moses and the prophets before him. Moses accused his people of not worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Stephen tells the leaders of the Sanhedrin, you have your nerve to charge that I have violated Moses and his law. Look at yourselves. He focuses his preaching on all the great spiritual forebears of the faith, including Abraham and Joseph and Moses, all the way to the moment that he's in. And he points to the truth of the prophets, showing how they are the ones who have led the church correctly or led people correctly. And those who are now in the first century temple are being unfaithful, not Jesus, not his disciples. Stephen makes the case for Jesus that he was fulfilling the law and the prophets, and like the prophets before him, he was persecuted unto death. Now his sermon seals his doom. He shows people their infidelity to God, and they can't bear to hear another word. He sees heaven, he sees Jesus at the right hand of God, and once he sees Jesus side by side with God, there's no stopping him. As he announces to the gathered accusers, your fate is sealed, his fate is sealed. He's as good as dead. Stephen is buried in the brutality of death by stoning. I want you to think about this for a second. People gather around him with rocks in their hands and throw them from four feet away until he's dead. While he's being pummeled by stones, Saul, a Pharisee, who later becomes Paul, the apostle, stands by and watches the cloaks of those who are stoning him to make sure the cloaks are okay and no one steals them. He watches the cloaks of those who would stone Stephen unto death. Never take a story in the middle and call it the end. Because the very same man who stands by to do nothing is the one who will give his life for everything. As he's dying, Stephen paraphrases Psalm 31 as he prays, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then knocked to his knees with his eyes set on heaven, he cries out his last word, Lord, do not hold their sin against them. The first Christian martyr dies, and like Jesus, with forgiveness on his breath, he gives up his life to God. He goes home to be with God and Jesus. In her sermon, Blood of the Martyrs, Barbara Brown Taylor reflects on martyrdom with these words. She says, I do not think you can seek martyrdom any more than you can avoid it. I think it just happens sometimes when people get so wrapped up in living God's life that they forget to protect themselves. Martyrs are ordinary Christians. None of them seek this state of being. All of them and all martyrs before and since simply live out the gospel in particular circumstances that they're in at the cost to their own lives. Each of the martyr stories have a common thread as we follow them through the history and story of our church. And that common thread is they, an uncomfortable truth that they have is that they are really what Christian success looks like because each of them find a home in Christ. Truthfully, none of our success can be found in converting other people to our way of thinking. Our success isn't found in having the most beautiful church in town. It's not even going out of our way to be kind and generous. In the case of every martyr of our faith, the Christian success that they show us comes down to telling the truth. 
telling it so clearly that people want to kill you for it. Telling the truth does not always end in martyrdom, but it can. While there are many ways we seek to change our surrounding culture and the times we live in, bringing a prophetic voice of critique to anything that harms God's children is really why we've been put here on earth in the first place as followers of Jesus. As the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., another martyr of our faith, noted years ago, the church has too often been the taillight instead of the headlight in the journey toward justice and righteousness. And taillights never lead, as you know. They're only on when you put on the brakes. But the headlights, they're the ones that guide forward in the darkness. So what do you want to be? Do you want to be known as a headlight or a taillight? Do you want to be a headlight or a taillight? Do you want to speak the truth with love to the injustice that is around us in this time? Or do you want to complain silently and mumble to yourselves when those injustices and lies wreak havoc now and in the future as they remain unaddressed? I encourage each of us to be headlights, to be truthful and live with the consequences. And there's no time like the present. Let's do it today. Let's start now. And if you're already a headlight, just continue shining forward. Finally, in John's Gospel, we, we, we really find our home in Christ. Jesus offers his disciples an abiding place in God. Some interpret John 14:1 as this, in my Father's house there are many mansions. In other words, there's room enough for all in God's abiding love. In God's house there's room enough for all. There's room enough for everyone who's in the pew. There's room enough for everyone to reach eternity. There's simply room enough for all because God loves all. We in the church need to know that the radical inclusion of God in Christ welcomes all. Moreover, it's not our house. It's God's house that we're talking about here, right? When we speak of it, we need to see ourselves as stewards of the gift that we've been given for a brief amount of time. We are transitory. We are between birth and eternity. And our time in God's cathedral of grace is a blessing, right? So we see ourselves in that pathway. Jesus promises to his disciples that that pathway to God is through him. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I appreciate what Joanna was doing with the signs today, the one-way signs, the, other, the wrong way signs. But I love what Catholic theologian and biblical scholar John Dominic Crossan says about this. Father Crossan translates the familiar, I am the way, the truth, and the life, this way. Going back to the Aramaic, he says, the truth is authentic, the way is a vision, and life is existence, so it comes out this way. I am the authentic vision of existence. I am the authentic vision of existence. Now, I think that works for everybody, right? I think we can all say an authentic vision of existence, that's worth following. Jesus embodies and demonstrates absolute and total and universal love for all, and his life, teachings, and behavior do indeed present people with an authentic vision of human existence. That's the model of the way to live and to follow God in Christ. So what does this all do, these visions of home? What does this give us as we set our vision on Christ in this light? Not everyone can separate themselves from the visions that they have and give themselves over to the vision of Christ. That certainly was true as Stephen faced it in the first century. This has to be a consoling message, though, from Jesus to the early Christians, who are Jewish Christians and early Gentile converts, that they have a place where they don't need to be anxious. They have a place that is their spiritual home. Because they've lost their place in the synagogue, they now have a place with Jesus. Jesus was consoling them. He was drawing them in close, in the same way we can be consoled, knowing that his presence in our lives draws us closer to each other, to our neighbors. And whatever it looks like and sounds like, whatever we see is the love of God expressed. And that's a vision of authentic human existence that's worth calling good news. So we're all seeking a way home. In the words of Peter, we're seeking to come out of the darkness into the marvelous light of God. And as we travel the road home, we'll find followers of Christ 
in the words of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who are headlights on the journey, not taillights, and they'll lead us, and we'll follow them as they follow him. Will we be led by the prevailing culture of our times and simply be taillights of this story? Or will we step brightly into the light of God and lead? That's what we have to ask and answer in these days as we find home. How will you follow the yearning of your soul to find home? To find our peace at home in Christ, each of us is called to follow the way, the truth, and the life, the authentic vision of existence. May the Lord bless and keep each of us as we find our home in God.